G'day rap bags. How aren't yous? All right. So something a little bit different today. Uh, not reading a whole book, just reading an excerpt of a book. So um, I recently saw the episode of Rings of Power that introduced um, the fairly, let's just call it, abominable take on Tom Bombadil. Um, and I don't want that to be, you know, one of the only kind of modern sources. I don't want that to be the one. Anyway, so I gathered up. First, first we found the old volume. We're not going to read from this one because it's, it's very, it's a 1991 edition, paperback edition, obviously. Um, this used to belong to my mommy. And, um, so that's, that's the, um, the th our special edition. I think my sister might have, I think my sister's got hardback editions as well. Well, she, I can't remember, but um, but we're going to be reading from this edition, okay, which is, I guess, one that came out um, after the movie. So this one came out in 2001. Uh, it's got the same um, note, forward, and prologue, and everything in it, um, but I think it may, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure how different it is, but anyway, all the, all the important parts are the same. So we're going to take it the um, the halflings have had a really rough night. They're they're staying at Tom Bombadil's and they have a quite the rough night, um, fully in and out of you know kind of terrible dreams and and hearing horrible noises and feeling great fears etc. And um, so we are going to pick it up in the morning. So I have not, I, I gave kind of a quick read through of this in my head just to pick the section. Um, this, so I haven't really rehearsed this. So I've already recorded it once and stumbled over something because I can't just quite seem to get comfortable. But hopefully this is the one. We're going to keep going. And if I make some mistakes, that's okay. Uh, because I'm not going to edit it. This is what, this is just what it's like when someone opens up a book, sits down with you, and starts reading a story. All right, so are we ready? This is from page 126 of the 2001 edition. <clears throat> they woke up, all four at once, in the morning light. Tom was moving about the room, whistling like a starling. And when he heard them stir, he clapped his hands and cried, Hey, come, merry doll, derry doll, my hearties. He drew back the yellow curtains and the hobbits saw that these had covered the windows at either end of the room, one looking east and the other looking west. They leapt up refreshed. Frodo ran to the eastern window and found himself looking into a kitchen garden, grey with dew. Well, he had half expected to see turf right up to the walls, turf all pocked with hoof prints. And actually, his view was screened by a tall line of beans on poles, but above and far beyond them, the grey top of the hill loomed up against the sunrise. It was a pale morning in the east. Sorry. In the east, behind long clouds like lines of soiled wool stained red at the edges, lay glimmering deeps of yellow. The sky spoke of rains to come, but the light was broadening quickly, and the red flowers on the beans began to glow against the wet green leaves. Pippin looked out of the western window, down into a pool of mist. The forest was hidden under a fog. It was like looking down onto a sloping cloud roof from above. There was a fold or channel where the mist was broken into many plumes and billows, the valley of the withy windle. The stream ran down the hill on the left and vanished into the white shadows. Near at hand was a flower garden and a clipped hedge silver netted, and beyond that grey shaven grass pale with dewdrops. Dew there was no willow tree to be seen. Good morning, merry friends, cried Tom, opening the eastern window wide. A cool air flowed in. It had a rainy smell. Sun won't show a face much today, I'm thinking. I've been walking wide, leaping on the hilltops since the grey dawn began, nosing wind and weather, wet grass underfoot, 
wet sky above me. I wakened Goldberry singing under the window, but not wakes hobbit folk in the early morning. In the night, little folk wake up in the darkness and sleep after light has come. Ring-a-ding, Dillo, wake now, my merry friends. Forget the nightly noises. Ring-ding-a-dillo-dell, derry-dell, my hearties. If you come soon, you'll find breakfast on the table. If you come late, you'll get grass and rainwater. Well, needless to say, not that Tom's threat sounded very serious, the hobbits came soon and left the table late and only when it was beginning to look rather empty. Neither Tom nor Goldberry were there. Tom could be heard around the house, clattering in the kitchen and up and down the stairs and singing here and there outside. The room looked westward over the mist-clouded valley and the windows were open. Water dripped down from the thatched eaves above. Before they had finished breakfast, the clouds had joined into an unbroken roof and a straight grey rain came softly and steadily down. Beneath its deep curtains, the forest was completely veiled. As they looked out of the window, there came falling gently as if it were flowing down the rain out of the sky, the clear voice of Goldberry singing up above them. They could hear few words, but it seemed plain to them that the song was a rain song, as sweet as showers on dry hills, that told the tale of a river from the spring in the highlands to the sea far below. The hobbits listened with delight, and Frodo was glad in his heart and blessed the kindly weather because it delayed them from parting. The thought of going had been heavy upon him from the moment he awoke, but he guessed now that they would go no further. Oh, excuse me. He guessed now that they would not go further that day. The upper wind, excuse me. The upper wind settled in the west and deeper and wetter clouds rolled up to spill their laden rain on the bare heads of the downs. Nothing could be seen all around the house but falling water. Frodo stood near the open door and watched the white chalky path turn into a little river of milk and go bubbling away down the valley. Tom Bombadil came trotting around the corner of the house, waving his arms as if he was warding off the rain, and indeed, when he sprang over the threshold, he seemed quite dry, except for his boots. These he took off and put in the chimney corner, and then he sat in the largest chair and he called the hobbits to gather round him. This is Goldbury's washing day, he said, and her autumn cleaning. And her autumn cleaning. Too wet for hobbit folk. Let them rest while they're able. It's a good day for long tales, for questions and for answers. So Tom will start the talking. He told them many, many remarkable stories, sometimes half as if speaking to himself, sometimes looking at them with suddenly with such a bright blue eye under his deep brows. Often his voice would turn to song and he would go, get out of his chair and dance about. He told them tales of bees and flowers, the ways of trees and the strange creatures of the forest, about the evil things and good things, things friendly and things unfriendly, cruel things and kind things, and secrets hidden under brambles. As they listened, they began to understand the lives of the forest, apart from themselves, indeed, to feel themselves as the strangers where all other things were at home. Moving constantly in and out of his talk was old man Willow, and Frodo learned now enough to content him, indeed more than enough, for it was not comfortable law. Tom's words laid bare the hearts of trees and their thoughts, which were often dark and strange, and filled with a hatred of things that go free upon the earth, gnawing, biting, breaking, hacking, burning, destroyers and usurpers. It was not called the old forest without reason, for it was indeed ancient, a survivor of vast forgotten woods, and in it there lived yet, ageing no quicker than the hills, the fathers of the fathers of trees, 
remembering times when they were lords. The countless years had filled them with pride and rooted wisdom and with malice. But none were more dangerous than the great willow. His heart was rotten, but his strength was green, and he was cunning and a master of winds, and his song and thought ran through the woods on both sides of the river. His grey, thirsty spirit drew power out of the earth and spread like fine root threads in the ground and invisible twig fingers in the air, till it had under its dominion nearly all the trees of the forest from the hedge of the down. Suddenly, Tom's talk left the woods and went leaping up the young stream over bubbling waterfalls, over pebbles and worn rocks and among small flowers in close grass and wet crannies, wandering at last up onto the downs. They heard of the great barrows and the great mounds and the stone rings upon the hills and in the hollows among the hills. Sheep were bleating in flocks, green walls and white walls rose, there were fortresses on the night, heights. Kings of little kingdoms fought together, and the young sun shone like fire on the red metal of their new and greedy swords. There was victory and defeat, and towers fell, fortresses were burned, and flames went up into the sky. Gold was piled on the biers of dead kings and queens, and mounds covered them and the stone doors were shut, and the grass grew over all. A shadow came out of dark places far away, and the bones were stirred in the mounds. Barrow whites walked in the hollow places with a clink of rings on cold fingers and gold chains in the wind. Some rings grinned out of the ground like broken teeth in the moonlight. The hobbits shuddered. Even in the Shire, the rumour of the Barrow Whites, of the Barrow Downs beyond the forest, had been heard. But it was not a tale that any hobbit liked to listen to, even by a comfortable fireside far away. And these four now suddenly remembered what the joys of this house had driven from their minds. The house of Tom Bombadil nestled under the very shoulder of those dreaded hills. They lost the thread of his tail and shifted uneasily, looking at each other. Sorry, looking aside at one another. Then they caught his words again, excuse me, and when they caught his words again, they found that they had now wandered into strange regions beyond their memory and beyond their waking thought into times where the world was wider and the seas flowed straight to the western shore and still on and back Tom went singing out into ancient starlight when only the elf sires were awake. Then suddenly he stopped and he saw that he nodded and they saw that he nodded as if he was falling asleep. The hobbits sat still before him, enchanted, and it seemed as if Under the spell of his words, the wind had gone and the clouds had dried up and the day had been withdrawn and darkness had come from the east and west and all the sky was filled with the light of white stars. Whether the morning and evening of one day or of many days had passed, Frodo could not tell. He did not feel either hungry or tired, only filled with wonder. The stars shone through the window and the silence of the heavens seemed to be round him. He spoke at last out of his wonder and a sudden fear of that silence. Who are you, master? he asked. Hey, what? said Tom, sitting up and his eyes, his eyes, and his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you, alone, yourself, and nameless? But you are young, and I am old. Eldest, that's what I am. 
Mark my words, my friends. Tom was here, before the river and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. He made paths before the big people and he saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the barrow whites. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already, before the seas were bent. He knew the dark under the stars, when it was fearless, before the Dark Lord came from outside. A shadow seemed to pass by the window, and the hobbits glanced hastily through the panes. And when they turned again, Goldberry stood in the door behind, framed in light. She held a candle, shielding its flame from the draught with her hand, and the light flowed through it like sunlight through a white shell. The rain has ended, she said, and new waters are running downhill under the stars. Let us now laugh and be glad. And let us have food and drink, cried Tom. Long tails are thirsty, and long listening's hungry work, morning, noon and evening. And with that, he jumped out of his chair and with a bound took a candle from the chimney shelf and lit it in the fire that Goldbury held. And then he danced about the table. Suddenly, he hopped through the door and disappeared. Quickly he returned, bearing a large and laden tray. And then Tom and Goldbury set the table and the hobbits sat half in wonder and half in laughter. So fair was the grace of Goldbury and so merry and odd the caperings of Tom. Yet, in some fashion, they seemed to weave a single dance, neither hindering the other, in and out of the room and around about the table, and with great speed food and vessels and lights were set in order. The boards blazed with candles, white and yellow. Tom bowed to his guests. Supper is ready, said Goldbury, and now the hobbits saw that she was clothed all in silver with a white girdle and her shoes were like fish's mail. But Tom was all in clean blue, blue as rain-washed forget-me-nots, and he had green stockings. Oh, it was a supper even better than before. The hobbits, under the spell of Tom's words, may have missed one meal or many, but when the food... Excuse me. But when the food before them excuse me, with the food before them, it seemed at least a week since they'd eaten. They did not sing or even speak much for a while and paid close attention to business. But after a time, their hearts and spirits rose high again and their voices rang out in mirth and laughter. After they'd eaten, Goldbury sang many songs for them, songs that began merrily in the hills and fell softly down into silence. And in the silences, they saw in their minds pools and waters wider than any they had known. And looking into them, they saw the sky below them and the stars known. And looking, oh, excuse me. And looking into them, they saw the sky below them and the stars like jewels in the depths. Then, once more, she wished them each good night and left them by the fireside. But Tom now seemed wide awake and plied them with questions. He appeared already to know much about them and all their families, and indeed to know much of all the histories and doings of the shires, down from days hardly remembered among the hobbits themselves. It no longer surprised them, but he made no secret that he owed his re recent knowledge largely to Farmer Maggot, whom he seemed to regard as a person of more importance than they had imagined. There's earth under his old feet and clay on his fingers, wisdom in his bones, and both his eyes are open, said Tom. It was also clear that Tom had a dealings with the elves, and it seemed that, in some fashion, news had already reached him from Gildor concerning the flight of Frodo. Indeed, so much did Tom know, and so cunning was his questioning, that Frodo found himself telling more about Bilbo and his own hopes and fears than he had told ever before, even to Gandalf. Tom wagged his head up and down, and there was a glint in his eye when he heard of the riders. 
show me the precious ring, he said suddenly in the midst of the story. And Frodo, to his own astonishment, drew out the chain from his pocket and unfastening the ring, handed it at once to Tom. It seemed to grow larger as it lay for a moment on his big brown skin hand. And then suddenly he put it to his eye and laughed. For a second, the hobbits had a vision, both comical and alarming, of his bright blue eye gleaming through a circle of gold. And then Tom put the ring around the end of his little finger and held it up to the candlelight. For a moment, the hobbits noticed nothing strange about this. And then, then they gasped. There was no sign of Tom disappearing. Tom laughed again and then he spun the ring into the air and it vanished with a flash. Frodo gave a cry and Tom leaned forward and handed it back to him with a smile. Frodo looked at it closely and rather suspiciously like one who has lent a trinket to a juggler. It was the same ring or looked the same and weighed the same for that ring always seemed to Frodo to weigh strangely heavy in the hand. But something prompted him to make sure. He was perhaps a trifle annoyed with Tom for seeming to make so light of what even Gandalf thought so perilously important. He waited for an opportunity. When the talk was going again and Tom was telling an absurd story about badgers and their queer ways and then he slipped the ring on. Mary turned towards him to say something and gave a start and checked an exclamation. Frodo was delighted in a way. It was his own ring, all right, for Mary was staring blankly at his chair and obviously could not see him. He got up and crept quietly away from the fireside towards the outer door. Hey there, cried Tom, glancing towards him with a most seeing look in his shining eyes. Hey, come Frodo there, where you be a going? Old Tom Bombadil's not as blind as that yet. Take off your golden ring. Your hand's more fair without it. Come back. Leave your game and sit down beside me. We must talk a while more and think about the morning. Tom must teach the right road and keep your feet from wandering. Frodo laughed, trying to feel pleased, and taking off the ring he came and sat down again. Tom now told them that he had reckoned the sun would shine tomorrow and it would be a glad morning and setting out would be hopeful. But they do well to start early, for weather in that country was a thing that even Tom could not be sure of for long, and it would change sometimes quicker than he could change his jacket. I am no weather master, he said, nor is aught that goes on two legs. By his advice, they decided to make nearly due north from his house, over the western and lower slopes of the downs. Excuse me, over the western and lower slopes of the downs. They might hope in that way to strike the east road in a day's journey and avoid the barrows. He told them not to be afraid, but to mind their own business. Keep to the green grass. Don't go and meddling with old stone or cold whites or prying in their houses unless you be strong folks with hearts that never falter. We said this more than once. Andy advised them to pass barrows by on their west side if they chanced to stray near one. And then he taught them a rhyme to sing, if they should, by ill luck, fall into any danger or difficulty the next day. All right, I'm going to attempt this. Hey, Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadillo, by war to wood and hell, by the reed and willow, By fire, sun and moon, hearken now and hear us. Come, Tom Bombadil, for a need is near us. And when they had sung this all together after him, he clapped them each on the shoulder with a laugh and taking candles, led them back to their bedroom. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. Oh, that just ruined everything. Actually, that was the perfect place to drop the book because that is the end of the chapter and the end of the excerpt. 
Whew. All right. I hope that wasn't too painful for you. I'm sorry, of course, all my lights are dying. <laughs> dum de dum de dum. Uh, so that was um, the last little part of chapter seven in um, in uh, in the first book of the Lord of the Rings, and um, I hope that that gives you. A very deeply dimensional image and feeling in your mind's eye now whenever you hear the name Tom Bombadil all right so thanks very much if um, for watching if you watched and making it to the end if you made it to the end uh, have a go of subscribing to make fulfill my dreams of becoming a real youtuber <laughs> So I can turn into flesh and become a real YouTuber. Oops, someone's walking up to my front door now, so I'm going to go. Thank you very much. Good night and see you later. Yeah.